What uh, do you see as the main initiatives needed to avoid a conflict in the region in the foreseeable future? Um, the, the region is facing many challenges um, and in many ways um, it has avoided dealing with its uh, serious problems. The uh, uh, period in the early uh, 2011 or late 2010 that we know commonly, commonly as the Arab Spring should have been a wake-up call for most Arab uh, and regional governments um, to start doing serious reforms, to start looking at uh, the infrastructure investments needed for their communities, to start uh, uh, bringing in more inclusive uh, political spaces. Unfortunately, what has happened is that uh, most uh, governments in the region, rather than embarking on such a uh, situation, such a process, uh, they actually uh, prefer to shrink back, uh, take the uh, sort of a more defensive position. And uh, most of their funding was directed towards uh, short-term uh, packages of uh, financial bribes uh, to their people rather than to seriously reform uh, their economy or uh, uh, create uh, jobs or uh, bring in uh, uh, more sustainable environmental processes or whatnot. So looking forward uh, 10 to 15 years from now, the whole region is heading to a perfect storm where uh, you have a demographic uh, a bulge, uh, a youth demographic bulge hitting the region back again in about 12, 15 years. Um, they're going to be mainly concentrated in cities that have been deprived of any real infrastructure investments uh, in the last period of time. Governments will have a lot less resilience to deal with the conflict because they have been borrowing money to uh, do these short-term investments to uh, uh, just sort of bribe their people rather than create real infrastructure for growth. Um, most of the young people in the cities will uh, be undereducated, uh, uh, but still they will be looking for entitlement, for jobs, for housing, uh, for uh, political voice, which will not be there. Uh, we're looking at environmental conditions exacerbating. The region is uh, buying more and more of its food from international markets. The ability of most countries in the region to continue to buy food is shrinking because they have been borrowing money. Uh, the region has been spending a lot of uh, money on militarization, and it is probably the region that spends the most out of its GDP on uh, militarization. Trade between the countries of the region is shrinking, which is uh, once trade shrinks, the incentive for keeping the win-win uh, gets reduced. FDIs are dwindling considerably between Arab countries, so there's going to be a lot of fight on how do we attract the FDI away from each other rather than creating complementarities. You add to that the fact that you have open wounds that are still going to be there in the region, Libya, Yemen, Syria, um, even though some of the countries are slowly emerging out of that uh, conflict situation, but these are remain uh, open wounds. <clears throat> in the do-nothing scenario that is happening right now, which is the zero-sum everybody is holding onto their position and not willing to consider a compromise uh, to reach a win-win situation, uh, we're looking at um, uh, most SDGs uh, either remaining the same or actually in some cases uh, retracting. So uh, 30 years of investments in the region uh, will have achieved uh, virtually nothing because uh, even in a laissez-faire, you still manage to get some um, betterment of poor people. Uh, so the SDGs are um, not likely to be met anywhere, uh, which is going to create yet an another added burden. So all of these things create um, what um, uh, I would call a multi-layered uh, conflictual dynamic uh, situation. And the question is, how do we start looking at, where do we tackle, what do we, where do we start from? Uh, most actors that are the agents that need to be tackling these situations are embroiled themselves in the conflicts, uh, either internally or uh, on a national level or uh, on a regional level. And in a sense, the local conflicts, the national conflicts, and the regional conflicts are uh, like um, 
uh, when you have a fire in a building and the fire is jumping through the vents from the lower floors to the upper floors. And in a way, we have no firewalls. Uh, so once um, uh, a fire erupts somewhere, uh, the region is going to have very little resilience in it to contain the fire. And as a result, we might see uh, over the next 10 to 15 years uh, a perfect storm in terms of uh, uh, conflicts jumping from one level to the next. So Omar, what would you say are the main priorities for reconstruction in Syria? Um, Reconstruction has become um, a contested field because everybody uh, is looking at different priorities. The government of Syria has its own vision and priorities of where it wants to go. Some of the international actors uh, are interested in uh, leading that process uh, according to their own uh, objectives and priorities. And uh, local communities on the ground uh, have a, uh, alternatively other sets of priorities. Of course, refugees, displaced persons, each one of them have a different understanding of the term. So uh, to a certain extent, there's not going to be a wholehearted uh, Marshall Plan uh, package coming to Syria. That's for sure not the case. Um, but there's probably going to be different kind of flows that will be um, directed uh, into this reconstruction uh, theme. Some of those funds will come under the guise of uh, humanitarian aid. Some of them will be humanitarian plus. Uh, some of them will be done under stabilization uh, frameworks. Some of the money will come from ODA funding under the name of redevelopment of sorts. Others will... Uh, uh, be investors, private sector investors who will be seeking uh, opportunities uh, in the future. And uh, some of it was going to be um, uh, Syrian expats sending uh, remittances back to their uh, families. Uh, in all, we're not expecting to see a huge sum of money uh, floating back, but even then, um, given where the Syrian economy is at this stage, um, the biggest risk of uh, any substantive flows coming in, you're talking about an economy that has um, reduced um, or is shrunk to more than a third of its original size, uh, a national budget that is uh, about 25% of its initial uh, pre-war uh, status. So even a small infusion of funds into the economy at this stage can actually play havoc with uh, inflation and can further disenfranchise a lot of people. We know from other post-conflict situations, and we're not yet in the post-conflict in Syria, but we know uh, in many post-conflict situations that even the very basic return to normalcy uh, does tend to create uh, major inflations. Uh, and inflation is going to hit hard on the uh, lowest echelon of the communities, whether inside Syria or people who are hoping to go back uh, to Syria. So unless we start thinking of packages that help communities on the ground uh, reach to uh, uh, sort of that space between the local government and the local communities, uh, this is where we need to uh, ensure that there's enough stability in that space before we can think about major uh, infrastructure. Because once you start dumping money from the top down, whether with a political transition or without a political transition, whichever is the political context under which that money is going to be put, you can expect inflations to raise 30-40% uh, in, in a matter of short months. And knowing that 80% of the Syrian community uh, at the moment is living under the poverty line, uh, about 40% or half of that uh, number is living in abject poverty. Any shock to the inflation uh, uh, at the moment can mean life and death, the difference between life and death. We know uh, that um, also um, the playing havoc with the uh, prices will eventually uh, lead many communities to sell wherever they are and move out uh, of uh, their homes. Many more people get displaced after war than during the war because of inflation, because of land speculation. Uh, so the question is, at the end of the day, 
whether that uh, uh, reconstruction is going to be supply-sided uh, thinking. Uh, and here, I, it doesn't matter whether it's being done by the government, current government, or a future transitional government, uh, whether that is done under the guise of a democratic process or not a democratic process. What matters is that once you start uh, thinking supply side, you're going to disenfranchise the poorest of the poor. You're going to uh, weaken their ability to withstand shocks uh, and inflation and rent gaps. Uh, which are uh, going to play havoc with the demographics even further in Syria. Uh, everybody's talking about uh, demographic change in Syria. The real demographic change will happen um, as a result of these economic forces that will be displacing a lot more people after the war than during the war. Thank you very much. So, Sanan, what, is, uh, what do you think is Iran attempting to achieve out of the current standoff of the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA? I think uh, Iran has a few objectives. Uh, first of all, um, it would like to uh, receive economic benefits uh, for staying in the deal. And in order to do so, it has to not only remain compliant in the JCPOA, but convince the remaining signatories, uh, the P4 plus one, to be able to uh, continue to provide Iran some sort of economic lifelines for the time being. Um, Iran is also uh, trying to demonstrate that it has the moral high ground and it is the accountable actor right now. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the government in Iran f uh, is quite frustrated um, by this standoff, feels a sense of injustice because there has been um, 13 verifications by the IAEA of Iranian compliance and um, there is a bit of a reckon, reckoning uh, and a debate going on inside the country as to how to um, handle uh, the standoff should Iran try to wait until 2020 before em engaging uh, in a more multilateral dialogue to resolve um, the JCPOA portfolio, but also the regional and ballistic missile one, or should Iran uh, begin uh, a, a quieter multilateral process um, uh, as early as next year uh, and see if it can um, try and um, obtain uh, some sort of resolution. And neither option is going to be easy and, and that's a bit of the challenge. Mm 